uh, thanks for having me. Um, I will I will tell you a bit about multi messenger data networks. Um, and, and this will be a mix of uh, science and the technical aspect of this. Um, so I try to use the science basically as examples of what can be done with um, with those um, uh, data networks. Um, so first of all, I would like to show you, I think, the first example of multi-messenger astronomy in uh, 1987, uh, a supernova exploded in the Magellanic Cloud. And uh, for the first time, we saw a neutrino signal uh, from, from an object uh, uh, outside the solar system. And uh, uh, yeah, I think really this was the beginning of multi-messenger astronomy. We had uh, roughly 20 neutrinos um, from, this, from this supernova. Um, if this would happen today, we are really well, well prepared with the superno supernova early warning system, SNUS. Um, that is basically a network of all the neutrino detectors uh, around the globe um, that are just waiting for a huge burst of neutrino, a huge burst of neutrinos coming from a potential galactic or close by uh, supernova. And the, the goal of this network is to um, yeah, watch for, for such a neutrino burst. And then if it happens, um, provide the community with a, with a prompt alert uh, about this uh, neutrino burst, so everyone could then basically point their telescope in, in that direction. Um, and we had roughly uh, 20 neutrinos from the supernova in 87. Um, if this would happen today, we would have uh, 10,000s of neutrinos, um, depending on, on the detector. So it would really be spectacular. Um, and what we would expect to see, um, as I said, is this um, burst uh, of neutrinos. And it would also be, uh, we would also see, uh, expect a gravitational wave signal at the same time. And all this would happen before we could see the actual electromagnetic signal, which was first uh, a shock breakout and then the typical uh, supernova light curve that one could see in, in optical. Um, and with the, with the setup of SNUs, uh, this could happen really fast. Um, this is the estimated latency for the alert that would be sent out by SNUs and, and more than 50% of the triggers would go out um, much below one second, uh, one minute, sorry. Um, so we really set up uh, well for the next supernova to happen in, in our galaxy. Um, so I wanted to mention this as an example. I'm aware this is probably not really relevant for CTA. So in the, in the rest of this talk, I will uh, focus on extragalactic, uh, transient, or variable uh, multi-messenger sources, and, and the summary is uh, of the sources we, we could potentially look at is uh, shown here in this plot by uh, Kota and Imre. And the type type of source types of sources can be um, split basically in three different types. Um, we have um, multi wavelengths and multi-messenger sources related to supermassive black holes in the center of a galaxy. So you could have active galaxy, galaxies that uh, um, actively accrete material and produce jets. And in those jets, um, you can produce uh, neutrinos um, and also gamma rays. Um, and, and here we could especially look for, for flaring lasers. Um, also, quiet supermassive black holes um, could give an interesting signature. If a star approaches too close to this black hole, it would be tidally disrupted, and parts of the disrupted star would then be accreted onto the onto the black hole. And in some cases, you can also produce a relativistic jet. Um, and and those tidal disruption events um, have become really good candidates for um, high energy neutrino production. Um, so this would happen in supermassive black holes, but also on the stellar scale, there are uh, interesting source classes. The most famous one is probably a gamma ray bursts, um, illustrated here. So if you have a really very massive star exploding, you have an extremely relativistic jet that can produce neutrinos and gamma rays. Um, but there might be a kind of a mild version uh, of such explosions uh, in form of engine-driven supernovas. So in this case, you would also produce a jet, but this jet is only mildly relativistic and is not energetic enough to penetrate the surface of the star, or only uh, pen or get somehow get um, stuck in the in the envelope of the star. 
So um, most of the gamma rays would be would be absorbed, or you only see a low luminosity gamma ray burst. So in the extreme case, all the gamma rays are hidden, um, but this could still be a very good neutrino source, and those sources are much more abundant compared to the compared to gamma ray bursts. Uh, and there's a, another class of supernova where the supernova explodes in a very dense circumstellar medium, and then you have interactions of the ejector with this dense medium, and you could have something like a basically a supernova remnant on a short time scale. Um, and you could have effective cosmic ray acceleration on the time scale of um, months uh, and produce neutrinos and maybe also gamma rays. And then finally, you have the class of compact object mergers, um, most famous one probably neutron star mergers, and you pr uh, produce this uh, kilonova signature um, and potentially also a also jet that can produce neutrinos and, and gamma rays. And uh, probably here more debated um, is the merger of two black holes. Normally you would not expect any multi-wavelengths or multi-messenger signature from that, except uh, the gravitation waves. But if this is embedded in an environment that still has some gas, then you could, you could see a signature um, um, and produce neutrinos and gamma rays in, in this environment. Um, so the, the challenge is to detect the multi-messenger signal from, from those sources. Um, uh, there are several challenges and let me start to list a few of them. Uh, the first one is um, the fact that the signal might fade quickly especially um, in the case of gamma ray bursts. So really quick communication is needed to um, distribute the information among, the, among a network of observatories to really um, trigger observations quickly and, and get the most information out of, out of the interesting source. And as an example here, I want to show an optical follow-up program um, that uh, Antares is running and the gray lines are optical GRB afterglows. Um, and every time Antares detects an interesting neutrino event, they send out a trigger to um, a network of optical telescopes um, that would then, as soon as possible, observe that direction in the sky. And, and, and you can you see the observations that they did in the past indicated here in this uh, colored markers. And in, in some cases, they really managed to observe um, the direction of the sky really fast. And in that case, they can then really um, well, if they, they would have been a gamma ray burst, they would have seen it, or they can exclude um, uh, exclude the existence of a gamma ray burst. But this is an example where really quick communication is key. Uh, another challenge is the uh, high data rate, or the fact that the data rate will get even even higher in the future with the uh, new larger observatories uh, that cover larger volumes. So we will really um, expect an explosion of the of the data rate. And as an example, I'm showing you here uh, this Wiki transient facility. Um, that's an optical survey instrument and it's producing roughly 10 to the six alerts per night. Um, those alerts indicate a variable or transient sources in the sky. And this way rate already large rate will even increase with the um, Vera Rubin observatory where we will expect at least a 10 times higher rate of, of alerts. And, and why we can probably handle this for like a single observatory, if we now want to start like correlating um, uh, different messengers uh, or several observatories, if we had now N observatories, each of them would increase their data right by a factor of 10, then we quickly arrive at 10 to the power of N. So we, we really get an explosion in data rate. So what we, what we need here is a smart selection of the interesting um, events in, in, in our yeah, large number of, uh, uh, of events focused on a certain science case that, that we are interested in. For example, the 10 to the 6 alerts in, in, in ZTF, uh, most of them would just be variable stars that probably um, for multi-messenger astronomy we don't care much about, so we could filter them out. Um, the next challenge is that if you really want to combine data sets in a reasonable way, you face the problem that you have complex analysis on heterogeneous data sets. So you really need um, a deep expertise from, from the various experiments. And as an example here, I show you 
uh, a gamma ray light curve of a gamma ray, a flaring gamma ray source that was found in, in spatial and temporal coincidence with the, uh, with the high energy neutrino. So the neutrino arrived here, and, and this is the gamma ray activity over 10 years um, measured by, by Fermi. So here the question, the immediate question that you want to ask is how likely do we find something like this by, by chance? And to answer this question, I think you have to analyze all the uh, gamma ray sources in the sky and, and look at their history and see how often would you by chance um, find a coincidence with a high energy neutrino event. And of course, you have to know how many events, um, how many neutrino e events or neutrino alerts have been issued, what is the spatial area that they cover, and, and those two information have to be, have to be um, combined. And this cannot be done if you don't have really the expertise um, of that, uh, of like in this case, Fermi and, and Ice Cube at the, at the same time. So for example, um, the, um, to, to really look at all this gamma ray light curves, uh, Sarah Bouzon, Matthew Wood and myself, we had to um, produce this long-term light curves for thousands of sources. And it took us uh, weeks to do this, to, to answer this uh, quite simple question, how often do we see something like this by chance? And I think if you don't have expertise and the resources, it's very hard to really answer this question. Um, the next challenge I want to mention is uh, provenance. So the problem we're facing is that we probably will only be able to study a few isolated events in detail and, and really to um, draw conclusions from, from the stu study of only a few events, we really have to understand very well why did we select those events and, and, and how do we estimate the background um, properly um, to really draw reasonable conclusions. And as an example here, I, I show you the optical follow-up of uh, gravitational wave events. Um, and since you all know, they cover like, huge areas in the sky. Um, it's very hard to uh, to follow up um, and observe all of this this area, and then it's it's important to um, uh, yeah have predefined criteria. What do you follow up, and how do you select whatever you find in there um, to to get an estimate how sensitive you are, and also to um, um, estimate the the background of unrelated things that you that you might find randomly in there. If you want to, for example. Uh, derive limits on the kilonova rate from, from such a study. Um, so I want to talk about two multi-messenger networks in, in detail today. The first one is the Astrophysical Multi-Messenger Observatory Network, uh, AMON, and the second one is uh, AMPL, that stands for Alert Management Photometry and Evaluation of Light Curves. Uh, so let me start with, uh, with AMON. AMON is an effort um, that's based at Penn State University. And the idea is to enable near real-time coincidence searches um, from a, a large amount of multi-messenger observatories and astronomical uh, facilities. So that would include cosmic rays, uh, electromagnetic emission, gravitational waves, and neutrinos. So there's uh, three main goals uh, that AMON has. The first one is to receive events and broad broadcast them to the community. Uh, the second one is to look for sub-threshold coincidences. Um, so using sub-threshold events from two or more experiments that by themselves are not interesting, but once you combine them, they actually might be significant. And finally, um, Amon wants to store events in, in a database so one could perform archival coincident searches uh, with that database. Um, so this is a list of uh, correlations that uh, Amon is planning to do. Some of them are already implemented and, and others uh, they're planning to implement. Um, for example, they're planning to correlate gamma rays and neutrinos, gamma rays and gravitational waves, and gamma rays, neutrinos, and cosmic rays. And then they have this pass-through channel that's just basically receiving interesting events from one observatory and just broadcast them to the, to the community. Um, so all the coincidence searches uh, define like a given uh, radius, basically, where you call something a coincidence. So that obviously depends on the angular resolution of the experiments involved. And then um, they define a time window. It's usually some generic time window that you have to define to 
basically suppress um, suppress the background. And then based on the on the time window that you choose, um, you are sensitive to uh, various source classes. Um, and since uh, my expertise is mainly in neutrinos, uh, I, I want to highlight a few science cases re related to neutrinos. Um, so uh, a little bit of background here. We have uh, three neutrino detectors currently operating. Ice Cube at the South Pole is the, the largest uh, operating detector at the moment, covering a volume of one gigaton. That's one cubic kilometer. There's also Antares in the Mediterranean and Baikal in, uh, in Lake Baikal. Uh, both in the Mediterranean and in Lake Baikal, the larger detectors are under construction, came 3 net in the Mediterranean and the GVD detector in, in Lake Baikal. Um, and at the South Pole, um, Ice Cube Gen 2 is planned that would have a roughly 10 times larger volume compared to the current Ice Cube. So, so far, we uh, have detected a diffuse flux of high energy neutrinos that is uh, shown here. So it's the, the flux times E square as a function of energy. And this is the diffuse neutrino flux that IceCube has detected. And um, um, in this plot, it's compared to the uh, diffuse gamma ray background measured by Fermi and the ultra high energy cosmic rays measured by Uji. And there is a strong connection between those three messengers. Um, first, in terms of uh, the energy budget injected into the three messengers, um, and also in terms of how they are produced. Um, and uh, I would like to show this here. So when you produce neutrinos, you need basically high energy cosmic rays interacting um, with the matter or ambient photon fields. And in this interaction, you would produce uh, neutral or charged pions. The neutral pines decay to two gamma rays and the charged pines decay to produce a, a bunch of neutrinos. Um, so that al already shows us there's a connection between neutrinos and uh, cosmic rays and also um, a connection between neutrinos and gamma rays because the, if you produce the charged pines that produce neutrinos, you always also produce neutral pions and produce gamma rays. Um, the problems with the gamma rays here is that uh, they could also be produced in leptonic processes and not in hadronic processes related to uh, neutrinos. And also when you produce them, you produce them at roughly the same energies as you produce the neutrinos. And, and to illustrate this, I, I show this uh, spectral energy distribution here. So in red, you would uh, see the neutrinos uh, and you have energy here uh, on, on top. So we produce neutrinos at, um, yeah, 100 TeV energies, you would produce gamma rays um, roughly in a similar, um, according to a similar spectrum. However, they would then be absorbed in the source and also during propagation. So you would not expect to see necessarily 100 TeV gamma rays, but they would um, yeah, interact on their way or in the source, and then they would cascade down to lower energies. And that could be, um, yeah, in the Fermi range or maybe even, uh, even, even lower in the MEV or X-ray range. So, so keep this in mind that this um, connection at the production doesn't necessarily look the same once we observe it here at, at Earth. Um, so, so let's go back to the goals of Amon. Um, the second one was to look for coincidences between subthreshold events. And, and with the neutrino gamma ray connection in mind, um, the Mon team now designed a sub threshold search um, combining ice cube events and Hawk hotspots. Uh, so, Hawk hotspots are defined uh, as um, excesses um, ab above 2.7 sigma, lo local significance, and they have a duration up to six hours and the six hours uh, is defined by the transit, transit time of a source uh, above the Hawk detector. Um, so by themselves, they're not significant. Also keep in mind, this is just the local significance. Um, if you um, now correct for the look as well effect, actually 2.7 sigma is not significant at all. Uh, the rate of those hotspots is roughly 800 per day. And those will now be combined with uh, an ice cube neutrino stream of a single neutrino track events. And those are also largely dominated by atmospheric background. So here the rate is uh, roughly 650 per day. Um, 
and and you probably um, yeah expect uh, a very small signal signal contribution to this. Most of those neutrinos will be atmospheric background. Um, and now Amon combines uh, those two um, with the goal to search for an extra galactic. Uh, source that is producing gamma rays and neutrinos. And the search is tuned in a way that uh, they would find four background events per year. Um, and and uh, the duration of the coincidence that they're looking at here is, is uh, basically defined by the duration of the arc hotspots, uh, which is a few hours. So they're sensitive to transients that happen on the, hour, on the order of, uh, of hours. And, and here's one example. Um, uh, the blue one would be one of the Hawk hotspots, and there were um, four neutrino events found in, in coincidence uh, with, with this. And then they uh, calculate a combined direction. There would be this uh, red circle here. And then this is broadcasted uh, by Amon to the community, and uh, everyone with a telescope can decide to, to follow up on this. And I guess this is also an interesting, um, could be an interesting science case for CTA to follow up uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, so this is one example for the subthreshold search implemented in Amon. Now I want to show some examples uh, for receiving events and broadcasting them. Uh, uh, so again, I use neutrinos as an example. So if we want to use neutrinos to trigger um, multi-messenger searches, then uh, we really have to get rid of the large background of atmospheric events. Um, and there's two different ways how this can be done. Um, and to explain how, how we can do this, I show you here the um, just the um, histogram, histogram energy of, of ice cube events. And in blue is the expected atmospheric background. So at low energies, we really expect a huge background of roughly one event per square degree per year. Uh, however, at high energies, the, the rate is much smaller. And here is where I can actually see the signal sticking out. So there we expect tens of astrophysical neutrinos um, at very high energies per year. Um, uh, however, at low energies, there's much more astrophysical neutrinos, um, hundreds per year, but unfortunately, those are buried in this very large background of atmospheric neutrinos. So uh, what can be done is just um, apply an energy threshold to select the highest energy uh, neutrino events that are quite likely to be of uh, astrophysical origin. And, and this is what uh, IceCube and also Antares is, uh, is doing. IceCube, for example, has a so-called gold channel. So those are the most interesting, most signal-like events. We have 10 of those per year. Um, and um, the background contamination is roughly 50% in this, in this channel. Um, there's also uh, another channel uh, with a higher rate, 30 per year, but uh, with a, at the same time, higher background contamination. Uh, Antares has three different channels. Um, they have two different energy. Uh, thresholds, um, very high energy one, reducing the rate to six per year, the other one is 12 per year. And then they have one where they combine high energy neutrinos with the local galaxy catalog, so they can lower the um, energy threshold and that gives them 12 per year. Antares currently is sending their alerts to only their MOU partners, while IceCube is um, publicly broadcasting them using Amon. So in, in this case, Amon basically gets the information from IceCube and then sends them out through the GCN network, the gamma ray coordination network, and everyone can sign up to receive those. Um, and the most famous example for one of those events that IceCube sent out and that was broadcasted by Amon is IceCube 170922A. Uh, there was a almost 300 TeV energy neutrino event. There you see the event display here. And that's a nice um, track-like event that allows an accurate reconstruction of the directions. So in the end, the 90% error contour at the sky covered roughly one square degree. And that was broadcasted uh, by Amon, and, and as you all know, Fermi then found uh, an already known gamma ray source in spatial coincidence with the neutrino um, that was also 
flaring at the time when the neutrino arrived. And I had already showed this uh, gamma ray light curve that shows nicely this large flare in temporal coincidence with the high energy neutrino. Um, in addition to that, then um, Cherenkov telescope, ground based Cherenkov telescopes followed up on this. Uh, and MAGIC was the first to um, announce the first detection of this source, uh, Texas or 5 or 6, in. Um, um, in very high energy gamma rays. And here you nicely see in the significance map that it's uh, really um, nicely spatially coincident with, with the high energy neutrino. Um, so this is really cool. So if we believe this um, connection of the neutrino to the, uh, to the gamma ray source, which uh, we find at three sigma significance, um, then it means that uh, the source has to accelerate protons to, um, to several PEV in order to get this high energy neutrino. Um, so we're covering uh, blazer flares now um, in, in our little sketch here. Um, but let's take a more detailed look at uh, how this detection actually, actually happened. So IceCube um, announced the high energy neutrino through, uh, through Amon. And uh, this is how this uh, GCN notice looks like. So it's a machine readable notice. Uh, it was issued 33 seconds after uh, the neutrino detection. And it has like the crucial information, the right ascension declination um, and, the, and the error of the source and the discovery time. So everyone with a robotic telescope could just sign up for those and automatically point uh, the telescope in that direction. Um, so what happened next is that uh, IceCube um, performs now a more time consuming uh, reconstruction uh, that takes a few hours. And, and once, they have the once they have the result, they send out a GCN circular. Unfortunately, this is not a machine readable uh, message and, and you, you see it here. So the important information are the uh, new right ascension and declination um, um, down here, and it took four hours in this case to, to issue this, uh, this message. Uh, the next, uh, next interesting finding came from uh, SWIFT in X-rays. They found nine sources um, in spatial coincidence with the, with the uh, neutrino error circle. Um, and it took them four days to, to issue, uh, again, a circular that is not uh, machine readable. Um, then finally, Fermi announced that, uh, that the neutrino was coincident with, this, with the source Texas of 506. Uh, this time in an astronomer's telegram, also not a machine readable message, and it took them six days. And they, they say here that they find the source in a, in a flaring state. Um, and next uh, came an ATEL from MAGIC after 12 days announcing um, the first very high energy gamma ray detection from, from the source. And um, here it's, it's easy to understand why, why it took them so long because they observed on September 28th and October 3rd. Um, so they first had to collect the data in order to basically reach this five sigma detection and then they could send out. Um, um, this message. Um, so the, the question is, for example, why did it take Fermi so long to, to, send, to send out the alert and, and how could this uh, basically be improved in, in the future? So there has already been some improvement to the, to the pipeline since detection of Texas of 506. Uh, for example, IceCube is now sending machine readable messages also for the updated uh, neutrino position. Um, so there is now a circular plus a GCN notice that uh, is machine readable with the updated position um, of, the, of the neutrino. So that makes it much easier for a robotic pipeline, an automatic pipeline to, uh, to get the updated uh, information. IceCube also started to uh, already check for uh, coincidences with cataloged Fermi sources, and um, this information is included in the GCN. Circular And also on the Fermi side, there have been several improvements and uh, automatization to the follow-up pipeline. And uh, what is interesting is that they have a light curve repository under development that would basically um, yeah, keep light curves of all the known Fermi sources and regularly update those light curves. So in, in that case, if we find another neutrino from a flaring source, it would be very easy to 
uh, answer the question, how likely is this a chance coincidence? Because all the light curves would already be uh, available. So that's a nice example how, how things have improved uh, after, after the detection of, of the Texas source. Um, now, coming back to using neutrinos as a trigger, um, we, we look now at this very high energy neutrinos that, that one can uh, use. But there's also a way to look um, at lower energies by looking for spatial or temporal clusters of neutrinos at uh, lower energies to suppress the isotropic background of uh, atmospheric events. Uh, and both uh, IceCube and Antares um, perform such neutrino cluster searches. Um, IceCube, for example, has one that is really focused on very short transients um, that looks for uh, neutrino multiplets within only 100 seconds, and then a complementary search that's uh, looking for clusters on all time scales up to 180 days. So this would be more targeted to uh, sources that are variable or flaring on longer time scales. And, and Antares is also looking for uh, short neutrino flares. Um, and, and the results of those searches are currently sent um, through the GCN network to private partners and uh, Amon is not involved at the moment in, in this broadcasting. Um, and um, so the, especially the search for short flares, um, sh short neutrino flares is targeting the um, class of uh, gamma ray burst or engine driven supernova that are kind of related to, uh, related to gamma ray bursts. Um, so this is interesting also for CTA, because obviously all of us know that uh, GRBs are also very high energy uh, gamma ray sources. Um, so I already showed this plot at the beginning um, that, that shows uh, the search performed by Antares, um, where they automatically point optical telescopes in the direction where they find uh, interesting neutrino events. And for a few of those um, um, for, for a few of the interesting neutrino events that they send out, they really managed to be on source within only uh, 20 seconds. In that case, they would be able to catch 95% uh, of the of the GAB uh, afterglow. So however, if you if you wait too long with your uh, with your follow up, especially if you only have a small telescope available, then you um, yeah you risk to miss the afterglow emission um, of the of the GAB. So it's really key to um, point your telescope quickly. And, and of course, the first step is to communi communicate the uh, neutrino information quickly to be able to, to trigger those observations. Uh, another example is uh, um, the, the first and only neutrino triplet that IceCube found. So those were three neutrinos that arrived within uh, 100 seconds. And you see the neutrinos uh, here um, in blue, green, and red. And the combined direction would be this black circle. And there was a large follow-up campaign. Um, for example, Swift XRT did several tilings to cover the neutrino error circle. Uh, Veritas also um, uh, observed. Um, and some of the observations happened quickly within 24 hours. And uh, unfortunately, nothing was found. But I'm, I'm showing you the upper limits from the various instruments here. Um, and. Uh, some later time observations uh, within 14 days um, are shown here. Uh, so what we can do with this upper limits that we that we received is to the first step is to disfavor um, a GRB scenario because um, in the rapid follow up in, in, in X rays, for example, there was uh, no interesting source found. Uh, but also the later time observations are important to um, now look at this engine driven supernova case. Uh, and what you see here at, at zero, you have the neutrino, neutrino triplet uh, arrival time. And then optical telescopes monitor the source for uh, yeah, up to 30 days. And this now allows us to probe um, um, the scenario of a choked jet supernova. And, and what you see here in the, this dashed line, it's basically a template light curve of a supernova placed at different uh, distances. Um, if it's very close, we would have seen it for sure, but even at a distance of uh, um, point oh, a point 0.15, a redshift of, of point of, 
or five, um, we would have um, um, we, we would have seen uh, such a supernova. So we can really, uh, yeah, exclude um, that there was a close by supernova producing those uh, those neutrinos. Um, so also here, quick observations are important, and also. Con uh, continuous monitoring of the source might be important to probe the different uh, the different science cases. So it's, it's very important to define what you're looking for ahead of time, so you can define your follow up strategy in order to probe um, to probe uh, this given science case. Um, so other sources also potentially interesting for for CTA. So I'm showing here some predictions for such. A, Transrelativistic shock breakouts or low luminosity GRBs. Um, this is the neutrino expectation from a source at 10 megaparsecs, and this is the expected uh, gamma ray flux for a source at 10 megaparsecs or at, at 100 megaparsecs. And it's expected that with the CTA, one could um, yeah, see such a source at, at 100 megaparsecs uh, with half an hour of observations. Um, so what we haven't covered here yet uh, is the um, type of supernova that explode in a circumstellar material. <clears throat> um, and here I just want to show some predictions uh, from Kota Morase. Uh, this is the expected gamma ray light curve from, uh, from uh, an interacting supernova. So you expect basically that it's bright for um, yeah, hundreds of days. Uh, here you see the neutrino and the gamma ray spectrum that you uh, that you expect. Um, of course, it all depends on the on the on the model parameters, um, but the gamma rays are shown here, and and unfortunately there's kind of this high energy um, high energy cutoff. Um, therefore, it's important if we want to see something like this with CTA that we manage to go to uh, low energies, um, and here. Um, we, we see what, what CTA or Fermi could do, um, depending on, on what kind of interacting supernova we see. So Kota here looked at two different um, template supernova, uh, basically. Um, and, and, and then de depending on the distance, it could actually be seen uh, in 50 hours of, of observation uh, with, uh, with CTA, especially if we manage to go to, to low energies. Uh, so those interacting supernova, as you can see here, they're expected on much longer time scales compared to the um, choke jet supernova. So one really would have to um, observe um, on time scales of months to, um, uh, to see the expected gamma ray emission in this case. Um, so how do we know that a close by supernova exploded? Um, you can of course go and um, read all the ATELs every day and, and then maybe you will find out, but there's a a much more convenient way you can sign up for uh, alerts from the transient name server. So this was uh, started by the um, optical and, and, and UV community, um, especially the, the supernova community. Um, every time they, they find a, a supernova, it is re reported to the transient name server. You can also upload um, um, spectral information there. Um, and then other people can, can sign up for alerts from this transient name server. Um, for example, robotic follow-up facilities could immediately get information from optical surveys and then perform um, follow-up in, in a different wavelength or spectral follow-up, for, for example. Uh, recently, also, uh, radio surveys have joined and they uh, report their FRB findings to the transient name server. And, and there is some discussion. Uh, to also include gravitational wave and, and, and higher energy surveys um, to this transient name server. Um, so let me show you some examples. So here I use the transient name server to search for events um, of the type uh, supernova 1C broad lines. So those are stripped envelope supernova with broad lines. Those are the ones that are the most promising candidate for hosting a choke jet. Uh, so you see there's a, a bunch of them. Uh, you get basic information, the name, the coordinates, who reported it, um, and uh, what, I, what I found interesting is um, 
if you scroll a little bit to the right, uh, you get, uh, so you get the, the data that was used to discover this and also who sent the information to the transient name server. And you find things like the Atlas bot, for example. Uh, so this is using Atlas data. It's an optical server instrument and it's automatically defining that this is something interesting. So automatically um, selecting the candidate and sending the information to the, to the transient name server. Uh, and then other people can now follow up. Probably this classification came, came later after someone picked this up as interesting and, and took a spectrum of the source um, and, and added this information here. Um, also, uh, alerts is also a, a similar bot. Um, on the other hand, also, um, um, you can also add something by hand. So, so this one uh, added by Stanek, that's uh, Chris Stanek at Ohio State University that probably found something interesting in assassin data and then just added this information uh, by, by hand here. But most of the sources nowadays are actually added by, uh, by machines. And, and one of those uh, machines that's communicating with the transit name server is, uh, is Ampel that's also serving as a multi-messenger network. So Ampel started as a, as a broker so-called broker for the Zwicky Transient Facility. That's an optical survey instrument um, um, that's basically sending all the, um, all the candidates for a variable or transient sources that, that it's, it's finding in, in, in real time. And, and Ampel is receiving those. Um, and uh, on top of this, it provides a, a framework to host um, user-contributed code. Um, so you, yeah, you can submit your own code that does some uh, smart selection with the, with the transient. Um, it also provides provenance tracking um, because it, you can use this identical framework in real time on archival data and also for simulated data streams. So this is very powerful to <clears throat> really uh, study the effect of your selection criteria and so on. And all the code is, uh, is open source. Um, so a few more technical details. So the way this is set up is that the users actually just design their own analysis schema that can uh, request uh, so-called units um, that uh, are already provided or could be also added by, by the users. So the units are pieces of uh, analysis code that can potentially be uh, very simple or very complex. Um, for example, you can do some alert filtering, you can match with existing catalogs, you can get some information about the spectral energy distribution, you can automatically schedule spectral follow-up, for example, and you can distribute alerts to different uh, sources, for example, to Slack, per email, whatever you want. Um, so this really uh, provides a framework to efficiently distribute and, and co-develop multi-messenger software. And, and I think this is a nice example to um, really define a complex science case and then uh, perform a targeted search for, for sources that are defined by your science case. Um, and that could also in the future deliver triggers to CTA, of course. And I will go through a few examples uh, of what you can actually do, or what we're already doing with, with Ampel. So we use it to search for uh, neutrino counterparts, for example. So um, the pipeline is illustrated here. We receive a high energy neutrino alert. This is the one that's broadcasted by Amon. Then we would automatically schedule observations with uh, ZTF to um, point at the position of the sky. Then um, we, um, we do a selection of potentially interesting candidates in, in, uh, in the data that we have collected with ZTF. This is to reject stars that we're not interested in planets, artifacts, asteroids. And then the next step, we would probably uh, end up with a handful of candidates. And now we can actually perform follow-up observations with other instruments that have a small field of view and, and that are more restricted in yeah, how, much, uh, how much observations we can, we can make. And that's, for example, Swift and X-rays, uh, that could be spectroscopic follow-up or radio observations. And once we do that, we can then actually classify the source candidate found by ZTF and we select those that are interesting neutrino sources. Um, and we, um, uh, one thing we, we cover with this uh, is um, the source class of tidal disruption events. 
And we found one really interesting candidate here is the Tidal Disruption Event AT2019 DSG, because no one can remember those numbers. Uh, the ZTF Black Hole Group um, calls all the TDE candidates after Game of Thrones characters. So this one is Brent Stark, much easier to remember. And uh, we found that Brent Stark was in spatial coincidence with the, with the high energy neutrino uh, that was sent out as an Amon alert. Um, and you see the optical light curve that uh, ZTF had recorded for the source here. And the neutrino arrived uh, roughly 150 days after, after the source peaked in, in the optical. Um, we calculated the chance coincidence that this would just happen by accident and find that it's uh, only 0.2% to find a TDE that is uh, uh, similarly bright and that's already including, including trials. So, so this uh, is very interesting, even more interesting uh, with the same program in Ampere, we found a, a second uh, TDE candidate coincident with another high energy neutrino. Uh, this is called Taiwan. And here you see a comparison of the light curves um, of Brent Stark down here and Taiwan shown in red. So intrinsically, so this is luminosity. So intrinsically, uh, Taiwan is even uh, much, much brighter than, than Brent Stark, um, which uh, yeah, maybe tells us that TDEs are emerging as a new uh, neutrino source class. So um, yeah, stay tuned for, for more information coming on this source uh, later this year. Um, our gamma, our gamma rays also expected from, uh, from TDEs. And again, I'm showing some models from, from Kota Morase. He seems to be the one that uh, does all the predictions. Um, and for, for TDEs, he uh, has three different models how the neutrinos could be produced. And, and all of them also come with the, with the prediction of, of gamma rays. So uh, the neutrinos could either be produced in the uh, corona uh, around the black hole or from a um, Radiate, radiatively inefficient accretion flow, so somehow from the, from the accretion disk. Uh, or he also has a hidden wind model explaining the neutrinos. And here you can, yeah, you can see the uh, prediction in neutrinos and the prediction in, in gamma rays. So potentially those could also be interesting uh, gamma ray sources. Um, another example is to use Ampel to monitor optical light, light curves and then to uh, trigger very high energy gamma ray observation. And this is work by Mireya, um, where she's using Ampel to trigger Veritas. Uh, and you see an example here. So she's uh, looking at light curves in optical. So those are ZTF light curves for um, a predefined list of, of gamma ray sources. And when she finds an interesting flare, then uh, Veritas would be, would be triggered. Um, and uh, the tool that she, that is a public tool, you can, you can look at it here, uh, already uh, provides the observ observability of the source of interest. Uh, so it's really nice to uh, yeah, look out for optical flares to trigger very high energy um, um, observations. And again, this is a nice example that you kind of need the expertise from people in, in both communities to set something up like this. And the final example I want to show is to use Ampel to search for kilonova with, uh, with ZTF. Um, so covering basically now the case of um, compact object mergers. And as you all know, the footprints of the gravitational wave candidates are huge. So it's really hard to perform a follow-up. Uh, ZTF has a very large field of view. So each of these little squares that you see here is one pointing of the instrument. So you can cover large areas, but usually not, not, not all of the footprint in, 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 in some cases. And then they have a list of um, selections because they cover so much of the sky, you would always find something uh, variable or transient. So you have to be very careful like uh, which sources you select for further follow up. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not going through um, all the selections they, they, they do, but one example, for example, it has to be far away from a bright source because that can cause some artifact, it's not supposed to be moving to get rid of, of asteroids. So you look at two consecutive observations and make sure that your source is, is not moving and it shouldn't have any history. That means you really want to see something that's, uh, that's rising and, and was not detected in the past because that's what you expect 
from, from a kilo Nova. Um, and this also allows you now to um, basically um, go back to archival da data and, and, and study like what is the background that you expect and so on. And uh, you can use this to really estimate the kilo Nova rate in the end from the upper limits that were derived by ZTF. Uh, here's one example of one source that was selected. So it looked potentially interesting, a rising source, but um, um, after a spectral follow-up, it was then figured out that there was a type two supernova and not a kilonova. Um, kilonova are also potentially interesting um, to look for very high energy gamma ray emission. Um, this is an example for HESS observations. Um, um, of, the, of the detected kilonova um, even at late times. And this um, observation actually allowed to constrain the magnetic field in, in the remnant, which is a cool application, even if you don't see anything from, from the source. Um, and that, that's the last thing I want to show, especially for this huge area, gravitational wave uh, events that uh, people want to, want to cover. It is really hard to cover all of the area and uh, there should be some coordination between the different telescopes so not everyone would just look at the same position but they would maybe spread out somehow to work together to cover all the area and, and for this uh, people have um, developed the, the so-called treasure map it's a way to share where telescopes uh, have, uh, have pointed and this is just one example for a gravitational wave event and, and all those different colors dot, uh, dots here and little squares show where the different telescopes have pointed. So you, you can look at this and then decide where you want to point your telescope. Um, so that's a, that's a useful development to coordinate observations. Uh, there are some other frameworks that I did not mention, but they could also potentially be uh, be useful in the future. There's 4Pi Sky, that's also an open so source um, uh, software package built for rapid uh, and automated reporting and response to astronomical transients. This is uh, mostly developed by the radio community. There's a skimmer that's a US effort, stands for scalable cyber infrastructure to support multi-messenger astrophysics. And uh, the goal here is also to have distributed data handling, computing analysis, and it's basically also a platform where people can develop code together. Uh, and I want to mention the Time Domain Astronomy Coordination Hub Tech. Um, that's a follow-up of, of GCN. Um, um, that's funded by, by NASA and will be uh, using the HIASAC database. Um, those are also programs under development right now that I didn't talk about today. And then I finished with my, with my summary. I think we're still at the beginning of the era of multi-messenger astronomy. We had a few uh, detections and we, we learned a lot from those detections. Um, uh, one thing we learned is that many of the potential sources are transient or variable. So we really need fast coordinated observations to get most out of, uh, out of the source to learn as much as we can. Um, some of the source classes I talked about have not been observed yet in TV gamma rays, but, but some of them have actually good prospect to be, to be seen by CTA. So I think that would be very exciting for CTA to, uh, to join this effort of multi-messenger astronomy. Um, I talked about different networks to trigger and coordinate um, observations. Um, yeah, they already exist and some of them are still under development. They allow to combine observations um, <clears throat> at, a, at a, a high level, at the catalog level, for example. But if you really want to go lower to test really predefined uh, complex science cases, you really need the expertise from all the involved experiments. So it's not just correlating everything with every, everything. Um, so that would be one approach to, to test a, a given science case scenario. Um, or the alternative approach would be kind of to correlate everything with everything and try to find something unexpected. And I hope with this uh, two examples that I showed, Amon and, and, and Ampel, I could give you a good overview of, of what is actually happening right now and what will be possible in the future. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>